People, I've got a big question for you this morning. Good morning. What was in Joseph's mind before he revealed himself to his brothers in Pharaoh's palace? Yesterday and today's readings from Genesis are, are foundational for society, for family, for society, for the world. What was going on in Joseph's mind? Did he ever expect the day that his brothers would come? Bowing before him. Okay, he had a dream. He told them. And they sold him into slavery. They wanted to kill him. Envy. People in the family feel envy. People in the family feel jealousy. Maybe there was a little touch of that in Joseph. He had a very special understanding of his life, what it would mean for his brothers. Who remembers Joseph's mom's name? She plays a big part in today's story as narrative figure. Who is Joseph's mother? And the, the role of, of guilt, you know, it's amazing when Judah is speaking, he speaks with a straight face, with incredible expressions of reverence before Joseph, not knowing who he is. Well, I mean, Judah knows that. Well, no, Judah doesn't know who he is. Uh, and he, he keeps up this face of innocence. What a capacity we human beings have to keep up a face of innocence, even in a court of law, even with accusers before us. And at this moment, Judah doesn't have any other accuser except his own conscience and the knowledge of his own brothers beside him. And they're not saying anything about their part in Joseph. And they're playing out the whole thing. What's going on in Joseph's mind in front of this hardness of heart of his brothers? Which is obviously a self-defense mechanism. which has to collapse, which is going to collapse. All our self-defense mechanisms collapse. Our justifications, our excuses. They have, don't have the strong foundation of this tree, all these roots. They look like they're strong. Our strategy is to defend ourselves when we're telling a lie. What's going on in Joseph's mind? It's an amazing story. Guys, I, all of you who are regular followers, I presume that you look up the readings ahead of time. You have the link because all you have to do is each day uh, click the little arrow on the top on the right and you can move into next day's readings and you can be a step ahead of the game. And you can put in your comments here. That's why I'm asking questions. What was in Joseph's mind? What was going through his mind at that moment with his brothers there? There are a couple of significant clues. 
in the text. I don't know if you have the text open there in front of you. It's a good idea. This is scroll and chat. So it can definitely be two way in as much as I can see. I can't hear you guys. You have the advantage of hearing me. So it's easier for you to hear my side of the reading. But when you can chip in there with your notes if you want. And this way we are all blessed with each person's comments and take. It's amazing, you know, the, the, the double words of Judah. Judah approached Joseph and said, I beg you, my Lord. He's calling him my Lord. <laughs> you know, like a, a subject in front of a king. Exactly fulfilling the prophecy that Joseph told them from his dream that they would all bow down before him. I beg you, my Lord, let your servant speak earnestly to my Lord. And do not become angry with your servant. He's not going to speak earnestly. He's going to spin a story. It's amazing that even God doesn't force us to tell the truth. But sometimes the circumstances collapse around us and there's no way around not admitting the facts. And so many criminals break down at a certain point and enter plea bargains or admit that they have done evil. There are so many covers that we human beings, so many skills at covering up at faking it, at falsifying. They say that there's no worse lie than a half truth because it has all the radiance of truth, but there's such a big portion of the real stuff missing that everything is out of whack. There's no, there's no more evil lie than a half-truth and the half-truth can be true but since the other half which is due to the story is not told then it's absolutely not the proper understanding of the reality This word earnestly, he says, let me tell you earnestly. Like so many people say to you, let me be honest with you. Well, does that mean they weren't honest all along? That they were conning you? Let me be frank with you. Let me tell you the whole story. And then we live with trust that people are telling us the whole story. What a challenge for us. The thing is, we have so many other vested interests that we don't want to expose ourselves. And so we think that it's in our best interest to tell a lie, not to come forward, not to come clean. It's wonderful when people come clean. The little child become, comes clean with the parents yeah, I took the candy and there's a big blush. It's a difficult moment, but the parents give the child a hug and it's okay. What's going on in Joseph's mind at this moment? It's one of the greatest teaching stories in, in culture, in history, in, in literature. And he's very concerned to know about his father. Is my father in good he health? That's afterwards then when he's, they discover it's him. And they can't answer because they're so flabbergasted. 
they just they just don't can't deal with it they're overwhelmed in shock and then all the earnest talk of judah becomes so fake it's revealed totally fake what is a wonderful life to build on truth even if the truth is very hard to hear and very hard to tell the people who build on truth and there are lots of such people and that's why society keeps going there are lots of such people but there are also a good shake of people it's our tendency our nature to to spin the story to cover up and since we've got our share of brokenness, it's the challenge, right? I invite you to, to ponder this reading today, to get into it, dig into it. And let's dig further into Joseph's heart. So Joseph recognizes his brothers. That's why he put the conditions down. You better bring your youngest brother with you. You remember the name of the youngest brother? It's not mentioned in today's reading, so I let you check that out. It's so easy to check it out. Maybe that will help you to find the name of the mother as well. Or maybe some of you put it on the screen already. I don't know, I hadn't checked. You know, one of the things that we need in our society again is to become really familiar with the biblical stories because they're paradigms of our culture, of our self-understanding. And they're also, in a certain sense, the cultural infrastructure of our values. A marvelous thing happens today in this in this story and the marvelous wonders that happen in, jo in Joseph's heart. The way he's able to interpret the happenings. Now what's going through his brother's hearts when they realize, well, he's <laughs> you're equal to the Pharaoh. That's what Judah said in his opening remarks. You are equal to the Pharaoh, the right hand man of the Pharaoh. You have the keys of the kingdom. You distribute the granaries. Uh, you open up the granaries. You distribute, you unlock them. You distribute the food for people in time of need. You're in charge of the budget of the government. You, you're the right hand man. You carry out all uh, the whole administration of the entire uh, kingdom of the Pharaoh. And Joseph has this power. I mean, he could take revenge on them. What's protecting Joseph from falling into the pit of revenge? From stumbling over that stumbling block and ruining himself? Because when people carry out revenge, they ruin themselves. Mud thrown is ground lost. The caption on that poster of an island, small little island, not bigger than one of these tables here, these, these, uh, park benches and you're standing up in the island the crocodile is coming and reaching up and you, you take up some mud and throw it at him you're you're dismantling your island of protection against him when we stoop to revenge we're putting ourselves at the same level of the evil that was done and joseph rises above this revenge he rises above rancor and i wonder what was in joseph's heart and Joseph also went through a tremendous spiritual process after the first visit of his brothers because now he knows his brothers and he helped them, he gave them food. And there's obviously the natural bond of family and particularly for his father. 
because his own brothers have done him so much evil. What saved Joseph from falling into the ruination of his own soul by carrying out revenge? What do you think? What protected him from that? And it seems to me that one of the, the possible, because they're not explicitly mentioned, one of the possible processes that went on in his soul was the reflection of the blessings of God in his own life. He had been uh, the target of a killing by his brothers, a murder target. And then he was sold by them into slavery as a reprieve from murder. But then he rose to be the viceroy of Egypt, the plenipotentiary of the Pharaoh. Amazing, isn't it? And he had to ponder that, or he had a, at least he had the possibility of pondering the blessings in his own life that took him out of the pit. He was thrown into a pit for a, a good while. And he had no chance as a little boy of getting out of there. And then they sold him to the traders. Who knows how the traders treated him. And how he overcame all these hang-ups and limitations. It's great to hear stories of immigrants and refugees. How they build lives. I knew a man who escaped communism in Slovakia. And he ended up being probably the wealthiest Canadian with uranium mines. Had the privilege of meeting him. And the serenity with which he spoke. The, and he came, he had, I think it was uh, $14 in his pocket when he left, when he got to Canada. He had experienced the blessings of the Lord. And he must have known the evil of rancor and how to overcome it. It visited his heart. Probably came back more than once. Bitterness knocked at his door. When we harbor bitterness over injustice in our lives, if we were relegated or demoted or not taken into consideration or rejected, who doesn't have some little experience of that? How do we deal with it? What's in our heart regarding people who have hurt us? What's the narrative we tell in our heart to explain injustice is done? like the narrative Judah has to cover himself. And we need to get clean with these things, to build our lives on truth and goodness. And the fact that we're just dust ourselves, that we're so fragile and break down so easily. We have a day when we ride high, we have power at our hands. And then there comes tomorrow and we're on our back and we need people to help us to the, the toilet, to clean up our, our butt. Who are we to lord it over our brothers and sisters who have done us wrong? And God knew this was the big vision of Joseph. Providence. God knew. He don't worry about it. He let them go. He freed them. He gave them freedom. He forgave them. And by doing that, he actually was super blessed himself because now he was free of hatred and revenge. He let them go. Drive out evil spirits. 
we don't have to take on the big devils and the exorcism. We can start with envy and jealousy and rancor in our own memory, not to let things knock at our door and stay knocking. Send them away, ignore them, drive them away. Remember the marvels the Lord has done in Je Joseph's heart and in your heart. And the gospel also speaks about how to handle rejection. It's not more than dust on your shoes. Forget about it. God bless you. See you later, alligators. What an incredible gift we have in our biblical culture and heritage. Remember the marvels the Lord has done.